So now we're moving on to a slap punch. And uh, not surprisingly, a slap punch is very similar to the chisel. So we're starting with our struck end and we're turning it around. The only difference here is we don't want this to grow wide willy nilly. So we're going to start by um, removing some of the excess material uh, that's at the end because we want this to be end up a specific dimension, um, depending on what you're making this tool for. Uh, and you're going to know ahead of time, but for the sake of this conversation, a uh, very common size is a seven eighths by one inch, one, excuse me, seven eighths by one eighth inch thick. So knowing that uh, we only want it a little slightly wider than the starting material, removing the material ahead of time to um, get ahead of the anticipated growth in width is going to give you a leg up. So we remove the material. You can see it's gone here from the sides. And now you start your chisel point taper. And we want it uh, to grow out, again, that 7 eighths inch wide. So you're going to want to keep it in check as you go and get it down to 1 eighth inch thick. Note that in this case, the indexing, the indexing is perpendicular to the finished edge. When you go to use this slot punch, your material is going to be on a long bar with you holding on to it facing you. So the indexing perpendicular to the slot punch edge is going to be important. Lay it flat on the anvil to get out any lumps or bumps that you got from um, drawing out that taper. And you want to make this all as smooth and flat as possible because, again, friction is your, not your friend. And the smooth surface will move through the material easier. Um, chamfer all your edges. You do want rounded corners for the slot punch. And um, following that line of sight that we addressed earlier with the chisel, um, we'll get you that nice flat edge on your, your working bit here of your um, slot punch. The edge needs to be perfectly flat. So to save yourself some filing time, go ahead and cut that off perfectly flat and you can, um, and so at this point, the tool is ready to be uh, normalized and filed the rest of the way. So let's just watch a video of a slot punch being made. So removing that extra material. And then just starting your taper, it's just a chisel point taper, keeping the end in check. <clears throat> we don't want it past whatever your prescribed amount is. And in this case, it's a 7 eighths by 1 inch, 1 eighth inch. I don't know why I keep saying 1 inch. All surfaces should be nice and flat. And for all of your edges, that'll give you a head start on the filing. As you get closer to your targeted size, those light planishing blows uh, become important. And then they will help you get a nice flat surface. Cutting off the tip to get a nice straight edge. And 
And now we are ready to normalize or anneal your tool and file the working end. Uh, the rounded edges here that you're gonna file in place need to be as long as the bar you intend to punch is thick. And since I would never punch more than a one inch thick square bar, um, which is what you'll use to make a leafing hammer, um, this, this should be back about an inch or just a little more than that. So to file those edges, put it sideways in the post vise and just start to round those edges. Um, if you start by kind of gouging in that, that back to that one inch or just a little more than that, you'll uh, be able to keep track of that and file it to the right length. The other important thing to point out here is that this should be wider than this right here. And the reason for that is because as you use this tool to punch a hole in a bar, that bar is going to um, react to that in a way that you could end up with the tool kind of captured in the bar. So the edges are going to curl up, the material is going to draw into the hole, and um, that's a it's a good idea to um, remove the tool frequently while you're hitting it for more than one reason. And I'll get into that in a little bit, but um, um, you don't want this to get captured in there. And then you gotta, you gotta work to get it out of the hole you started to punch. Uh, you'll win eventually, but you're not gonna like it. So ha giving yourself just this little extra cushion here um, that can be obtained with the filing is important, but then keeping this edge a little wider. Um, these are also combustibles. These are tools you're gonna kind of go through. Uh, they're also gonna get a little smaller, or you're gonna need to make a new one. Uh, they only have so much life in them. Um, how you use the tool will dictate how well the heat treatment and ultimately the tool holds up. So you would heat treat this just like we did the chisel. Um, um, you just like we heat treated for the chisel, you'd use the same process, and it's about the same size. So uh, everything should be relatively similar as long as you're using 4140 or 4130. And the different sizes, um, these are highlighted in yellow. There's probably the most common sizes that you'll need, but you should have a little um a drawer full and know what different size slot punches get you so um a slot punch of 17 uh, 9 16 by 1 16 uh, can be drifted to a, a half inch punched hole three quarters by 1 16 which is very thin uh, will get you a square hole or for a diamond. Um, so I just wanted to throw these sizes up there to to kind of bring home the point that um, it's you're, you're going to need more than one. It's a disposable tool, and um, um, if you want to go practice that, these are some sizes I would recommend. So now we're ready. Uh, to move on to the hammer eye drift. Um, in reality, you might make your hammer eye drift first because the drift is what dictates the final size of the hole. And the drift has to fit into the slot punch hole. So making your drift first, now you know what size your slot punch needs to be. Um, a hammer eye drift, uh, you, you can have more than one type of drift. 
the drift I'm going to show you here is a through and through drift. In other words, you punch a hole in a bar and then you put the drift in there to dress the sides of the bar. Um, if you're making a hammer, you would dress what they call the cheeks of the hammer. So you're going to leave it in place. So the working end is actually the middle of the piece. Um, I'm going to move to show you one here. So the middle of the piece is the working part. This part is the size um, that the slot punch needs to match. This part is the size of the hole you want to make. And this part needs to be long enough so that you can hammer it all the way through. This drift is intended to push all the way through a hole. Another kind of drift is one that you would push in one side, but it's so wide on the other end that you, you would never push it all the way through. Its intent is to just widen or set a taper on one side and then usually the other side of a hammer creating a narrowing in the middle, which gives the handle for your hammer uh, um, a little better chance to, to hang on to the hammer head. So um, again, this through and through drift is kind of like a dinosaur, you know, it's fat in the middle, thin on one end, and then thin again on the other end. This is your struck end. This is the insertion end and the working bits are in the middle. The other thing I want to point out is these sides are rounded here. So as you're working with your three quarter inch round bar of the same kind of metal that I've already talked about, um, you would never dress these sides. You would want those to stay round and that'll get you this nice round inside of your hole, in this case, a hammer. So let's start with the working end. First, you, you, we know we want a little taper back here that's long enough to go all the way through the, uh, the ultimate size or uh, length of those cheeks of the hammer. So you're gonna start by removing some material because we don't, we're not gonna need all the material here. And then uh, flattening that out to a fairly stout uh, taper at the end and flatten that back as far as the, the heat that you had on there will allow you. Then you wanna take the corners off. What you don't want is to end up with kind of a square portion here that's a little wider on the diameter than the ultimate middle or working part of your hammer drift. So you would take those corners off up to the point um, you forged and again leaving these sides to stay round so that the end result of your drifted hole is those round edges, that nice oval shape. Once you have your struck end, now you can work on the other end and this is gonna get even smaller than the struck end. So uh, again, get ahead of it by removing that material and notice that we're removing the material perpendicular to the side we started. And then you would turn it um, and get your chisel point on there. Anytime you do a taper, I know I've already said it a couple times, make your point and then um, elongate the taper. Chamfer all these edges up to the point you forged. And uh, even with that, you're gonna end up rounding some of these edges with a file and you'll end up with a nice uh, flattened, um, drift with the rounded working bits here. So let's watch that happen. 
So remember, we start by removing some material, but not a lot. This end is going to stay fairly thick. And then putting a slight taper on there. Round or chamfer all of your corners. And that angle of that hammer is just rounding those corners a little more. So there's your struck end. And now we're going to remove a lot more material from the uh, starting end or insertion edge. And going over to the bic, we'll, we'll move that along faster. You want to keep everything nice and straight. You'll take off the edges of your of your um, chamfer the edges there. But again, you're never dressing the sides here on the working side working um, part of the drift. So again, notice the angle of the hammer as you knock down all these corners, that'll save you some filing time. You will end up filing, but the more you, those corners are knocked off, the less time you'll spend doing that. Light planishing blows, especially when the meadow gets this dark. Okay, so there is your hammer eye drift and um, it's now ready to use. There's no need to heat treat this. The um, reason for that is the way we're gonna use it, it's just gonna lose, you're gonna tick it off. Um, um, I see you, Greg. We lost Greg for a second. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm back. Um, okay. Nope, hoping I didn't miss any questions or anything. I do have some questions, but I'll wait till you get done with this portion. Sorry about that. Okay, great. Um, I'm excited for questions. Um, then I don't feel so alone over here. So um, the way you're using the drift, it will just lose its temper and any heat treatment that you do. So there's no, no need to heat treat it, but it does make it an even more disposable tool or a consumable than your other ones. Um, Cause what you're gonna do is you're gonna insert it into this hole, um, dress these cheeks in whatever manner you want um, and either knock it all the way, knock it all the way through and then reinsert it from the other side and dress the other side of the hammer with the idea that you'd end up with a nice even hole um, and the cheeks exactly the way you want them. All right, so before I move on, let's take some questions.